When we began our research into the 1994 disappearance and presumed murder of Ravel Balmain, New South Wales Police told us that after 27 years, the case was under review. In fact, a very significant development was imminent. It's one of Sydney's most intriguing murder mysteries. Ravel Balmain hasn't been seen in almost 30 years. Police are now offering $1 million to anyone who can help catch her killer. We're very keen to get this reward out to the public and we thank the minister and the government for allowing us to offer a million dollars as a reward. She was a model, a dancer and a sex worker. I said, Ravel, not all men are nice. Someone murdered Ravel Balmain. Was it the client? On legal advice, he declined to answer any questions. The agency? Or someone else? Police naming the man they believe responsible for her disappearance. She's never been found, but a million dollar reward may crack the case. We just want them back. Saturday, the 5th of November, 1994, was to be Ravel Balmain's last day in Sydney. The next day would be the start of a new chapter. She would catch the train to Newcastle to visit her parents, Ivor and Jan. Then it was off to Brisbane for two weeks rehearsal, followed by a four-month dance tour in Japan. Her life had taken some dark turns. Now she was returning to her enduring passion. I just watched Ravel from the age of three dance, right up until she was 22. She had a lot of personality and a lot of emotion. I think jazz was her thing. She enjoyed tap as well because it gave her more of a flair of her personality. She did it all. Mum taped every Sedford that she actually put on. So there's tape after tape after tape. She was passionate about life, her friends. She was happy and friendly. She was quite headstrong. She was stubborn, she was cheeky, she was loving, she was affectionate. But she was determined. Um, you know, if she wanted something, she would go after it. As a young adult, she had goals. Most of them were through dance and later through modelling. After she returned from Japan, that's what she wanted to continue with. Ravel was making inroads as a model. She'd just shot her first magazine cover. But it wasn't enough to pay the bills. The 22-year-old decided to supplement her earnings in Sydney by working as an escort. I think there are a lot of young women who work for a short period as an escort, and she was one of those. John Dale is a Sydney-based writer with a deep knowledge of the Ravel Balmain case. I think her attention was to get out of the industry for sure. Why do you think she wanted to get out of the industry? Well, one reason was she'd met a new boyfriend who she was quite uh, attracted to, Piers Fisher-Pollard. Piers Fisher-Pollard, 27 at the time, started dating Ravel four weeks before she vanished. He maintains he had no idea about his girlfriend's secret life as an escort. She was genuinely one of those people who'd, who'd just walk into a room and, and light it up. Piers says that in the short time they knew each other, they were inseparable. We liked each other a very lot. And you thought that perhaps you could fall in love with her? Ah, oh, we were. We were falling in love. We've obtained a statement Piers Fisher-Pollard gave police on November 10, five days after Ravel's disappearance. He recounts the events of the previous Saturday, he and Ravel woke up together 
at her Bellevue Hill apartment. Piers was suffering a migraine. Piers told police they went to a medical centre in Bondi Junction. Ravel tried to call her best friend, Kate Brentnell, from a public phone box, but she didn't answer. So Ravel suggested she and Piers have lunch, but he declined because of his migraine. Piers watched Ravel board a bus, headed to the city via Paddington at about 1 p.m. That was the last time he saw Ravel. Knowledge of Ravel's movements over the next few hours is sketchy, but we do know she called the Select Companions Escort Agency, owned by husband and wife Zoran and Jane Stanojevic. Ravel accepted a 4 p.m. appointment with a man named Gavin Owen Samer. Samer was no high roller. He worked for his parents' clothing business packing boxes. He was also a keen surfer. He lived in McNair Avenue, Kingsford. She arrived at 10 to 4. She was carrying two bags. She had these platform heel shoes. She had a cardigan, a long skirt. And she bought a bottle of champagne, which he'd requested. She rang the agency to say, I'm here. I'm safe. Everything's OK. She was booked for two hours. But unbeknownst to select companions, according to Samer, she organised for another hour of moonlighting where he would pay her money in cash. Ravel had a pager with her. Before mobile phones took over, people carried pages and received messages the same way we get texts today. An hour into the booking, Ravel got a page from her boyfriend who'd recovered from his migraine. Piers paged her at 5 p.m. And when he went to his friend's place, a woman called Zoe, Ravel had already rung Zoe and told her that she was having a sleep. Piers readily accepted the story that Ravel was sleeping because she hadn't told him she was a sex worker. At 7 p.m., she received a message from her best friend, Kate said, ring me. At 15 minutes later, she rang Kate at 7.15. Kate Brentnell later made a statement to police about taking that phone call from Ravel. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm just sitting here. I said, is he sitting there? She said, yes. I drew from this that Ravel wasn't in a position to talk freely. Ravel said, I'll call you from home in about an hour and get changed, and then I'll come to your house and we'll go to the Royal for a few beers and I'll meet up with Pierce later. The Royal is a popular pub in Sydney. So she was now free to make arrangements with Piers and also Kate? She was. Neither one she fulfilled? That's correct. That phone call was the last time she spoke to anyone other than Samer that we know. Gavin Samer told police that Ravel had accepted a ride from him after the booking. He dropped her off outside the Red Tomato Inn on Anzac Parade, Kingsford, which was just a few blocks from where he lived. The sun set that evening at 7.26 p.m. It was around then, according to Samer, that he last saw Ravel getting out of his car. Piers paged her at 7.53, according to the police report. But she didn't respond to that page. By this time, Piers had met with their mutual friend, Zoe. They went to various bars around the city. He kept paging Ravel regularly throughout the night. His last page was 2.30 a.m. And then he went home to bed.
Ravel's mother, Jan, became concerned when her daughter failed to arrive in Newcastle on the Sunday morning train from Sydney. She rang Ravel's friends and her flatmate, who said her half-packed suitcase was still on her bed. Her flatmate then reported her missing. Five days later, the police issued a public alert and acknowledged that Ravel had disappeared. Police in Sydney fear for the safety of a young model who's been missing for six days. 22-year-old model Ravel Balmain went missing in Anzac Parade at Kingsford around 7 o'clock last Saturday night. Early on, police believe Ravel had been abducted after her last appointment. Police believe within half an hour of being dropped off, she was simply snatched from the street. Members of the public found Ravel's personal items scattered in the streets around Kingsford within hours of her suspected abduction. Police recovered her shoulder bag, keys, a pair of platform shoes and her diary. We believe that they've uh, been thrown out from probably a motor vehicle as it's uh, driven away or as it's driven to that other spot. There was still a faint hope that Ravel was alive and being held captive by her abductors. Nearly seven weeks after she disappeared, New South Wales Police organised for a model dressed as Ravel to re-enact her last possible movements, walking the streets near the Red Tomato Inn. The frustrating part is that there's someone out there or some people out there that do know, and uh, it's just so difficult to accept that. There was relentless interviews with the media, but the media assisted us greatly because we needed to keep her, her story out into the papers and on TV. Ravel's distraught family were desperate they made flyers which included the police's abduction theory. We put these flyers into the local shops. They talked to people in the Kingsford area. The only way that we could get through it was our conversations on the phone every night. We are worried. And we're not happy. If you know of anything, just ring the police, it's as easy as that. We just want them back. Next. There were scratches on his chest. Gavin Samer becomes a person of interest. He said he didn't know how he got them. There are increasing fears tonight that missing Sydney model Ravel Balmain may have been abducted. 22-year-old Ravel vanished at Kingsford on November 5. Police suspect she was abducted. I'm totally concerned for her because uh, she's a young girl and uh, uh, as I say, that uh, the situation may well have been that she was taken from the street. The New South Wales Police did nothing to discourage media from reporting that Ravel Balmain may have been abducted. But here's what they weren't telling the public. They didn't reveal details about her life as a sex worker, nor where she was last seen alive. Two days after she disappeared, police hauled in Gavin Owen Samer for questioning. What did they learn from Gavin Samer? They learned that there are a number of inconsistencies in his story, that there were certain things they noticed about him, there was a scratch, like a fingernail scratch, on the left-hand side of his neck. There were scratches on his chest, which the forensic pathologist said were suggestive of fingernail scratches. And there was a cut in the middle of his left finger, which, again, the forensic pathologist said was suggestive of a bite mark. 
So how did Gavin Samer explain the scratches on his neck, on his chest, and the possible bite mark on his finger? Initially, in the first interview, he said he didn't know how he got them. In the second interview, he said he remembered that he got them surfing. He might have got them on his surfboard. He wasn't sure. Police examined Samer's wetsuits to see if there was damage consistent with his scratches. The results were inconclusive. Then later, he said he could have got a couple of them gardening. Samer's girlfriend, who was away for the weekend that Samer booked Ravel, noticed his scratches when she returned. She told police he'd washed the bed sheets, which was an unusual thing for him to do. The car had also been cleaned. So was there any DNA material whatsoever found in the car, or was there a proper forensic examination of the car? There wasn't any forensic investigation of the car until, I think, nine, 10 days later. However, there was no forensic search of the McNair Avenue property. If there was any evidence of a blood trail in the house, forensics would have found it. Police did ask Samer how he paid Ravel for the booking. The bill, the three hours, came to $500. Samer told police that he hocked his girlfriend's clarinet for $250 on the morning of that Saturday and that he went to the Red Tomato Inn, played the card machines and won 150. So he had $400. He said in his statement he paid her $400 cash and gave her a $100 check from his family's checkbook. When police asked to see the checkbook, it was missing. He couldn't find it. Police did then go and search his home. They did. They searched it initially without a search warrant, so they just had a look around. Police searched the home twice, looking for the elusive checkbook. It was never found. The other interesting thing about the money is that where he played the card machines, they weren't like poker machines where the money comes out. You had to go to the bar and get credit. No one remembered him playing those card machines on that day. No CCTV back then? No CCTV, no mobile phones either. Now called Churchill's, the Red Tomato Inn was crucial to Samer's alibi the night Ravel went missing. He told police he dropped Ravel outside the pub, then parked his car around the back. He went to the bottle shop, bought some cigarettes and some Strongbow cider, and then drove home to watch Hey Hey It's Saturday on Channel 9. But when police checked, the bottle shop had no evidence of any transactions matching Samer's claims. His alibi had been shaken. The police canvassed the Red Tomato Inn. They checked everyone who was in there, the owners. They also dressed up a girl like Ravel and had a walk around. No one saw her enter that hotel. No one saw her in that area. No one saw Sama either. But they'd found her cork platform shoe, her diary, around 11.20, 11.30 that night. Someone coming back from the pictures of Randwick Ritz found those items. And the next day, they found the keys and the other shoe scattered in another street. A car similar to Gavin Samer's was seen stopped in Araluen Street, Kingsford, late on the night of November 5, close to where Ravel's house keys were found the next day. 
Despite the evidence implicating Seymour, there was not enough to charge him. He was, in fact, a potential witness in the abduction theory. Seymour told police that he dropped Ravel at the Red Tomato Inn, but there was nothing to corroborate this. All they had was Seymour's word. How do you think the police handled the initial investigation? Quite a few things, unfortunately, were missed. It makes such a difference, like 20 plus years down the track. The last person to see her alive wasn't interviewed until late Monday afternoon, which was over 24 hours after the report was made. The property wasn't searched until five days later. The car wasn't searched until seven days later. Her belongings that were found in the streets were thrown into an uncovered box. Anyone could have wandered into her room and take whatever they wanted because it wasn't closed off. People that should have been interviewed weren't, um, clients that should have been interviewed weren't. And to my knowledge, only one area of Sydney was searched. Coming up. I know that Ravel had done enough to make them angry. What do the owners of the escort agency know about Ravel's last movements? I've seen, you know, conflicting statements about where they were when Ravel disappeared, which were huge red flags. An up-and-coming model and dancer, life had never been better for 22-year-old Ravel. But last Saturday night, she simply vanished, moments after being dropped off in Anzac Parade at Kingsford. I just remember when I saw Ravel on the news, straight away I rang the agency and I said, oh, is that Rachel? And she said, yes. And I said, oh, was she on a job? And they said, yes. Kim Hollingsworth holds a unique position in the history of the New South Wales Police Force. In 1995, she was accepted as a recruit at the police academy in Goulburn, but was hounded out of the force when her former life as a stripper and a prostitute came to light. We approached Kim to talk about her life as an escort when she knew Ravel by one of her working names, Rachel. She was a strikingly attractive girl. Just beautiful, gorgeous to look at. And she had this poise that I, I think I never perhaps had. She looked like she just walked out of finishing school, you know. And she was just elegant and, and she spoke so eloquently and she was always polite. So she kind of had the whole package going on. For a client, it would be, wow, you know, I haven't drawn the short straw on this one. Wow, this, she's beautiful. In those days, we worked with pages, which were just an antiquated kind of method of text messaging one way to us. The agency would provide us with them and you'd hear this da -da 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 -da, and you go, oh no, it's a job. So you would have to quickly run to a landline, ring the agency, and they would tell you that there was a booking. On this occasion, it was at Paddington. And there were two gentlemen, and they wanted two girls. My name was Natalie at VIP Escorts, and Ravel's name was Rachel. So all I knew was that this girl called Rachel was coming gentlemen were really nice, we were just making small talk. And then there was a small tap on the door. And in glided the swan Ravel. So while the gentleman retreated upstairs to decide who was going to see Ravel, Ravel and I had a conversation. And that conversation revolved around modelling and dancing. And I distinctly remember Ravel said, well, Peter Chadwick is interested in me. Peter Chadwick was the founder of Chadwick's Models, the top model agency at the time. And it was just the way she said it that triggered me in thinking, well, the stereotypical client isn't going to want to hear that. He doesn't want to hear you're successful. All he wants to know is how good he is, not how good you are. You warned her? I warned her. What did you say? 
I said, Ravel, um, not all men are nice. You've got to be really careful the way you talk. And her exact words in response were, I know what I'm doing. And that terminated the conversation. Kim knew from experience how dangerous Sydney's sex industry was in the 1990s. Every time Kim accepted a booking with a client, the threat of violence was ever present. We just went, oh, well, you know, they're going to get violent towards us. We've got to be careful. We have to edge our way around that to make sure we come out of the booking in one piece. It was very difficult. Every booking was different and, and you had to really concentrate and you had to watch every move because you might be robbed, you might be sodomised. And before you knew it, it just became this assault. It wasn't just a prostitution job, it was an assault. Because knowing the long history of women being murdered in the sex industry, mm. it's a very dangerous job. Mm. Hugely dangerous. I don't think we realised quite how dangerous it was because we always thought the agency was going to support us, but that, that simply wasn't true. The client was number one. Girls were money. That's, we were chattel. We were money to them. They should have been taking a lot more care of their girls. And that was the problem with the agencies in that, you know, they wanted the money so bad, we were being sent out to vacant blocks of land, you know, because it, w it was a joke call. And they had a lot of power because there's always somebody else who will come and do the job. Mm -hmm. So you were disposable, expendable. Exactly. At the time Ravel disappeared, she was working for Select Companions Escort Agency. Kim had also worked for Select and learned that Ravel's relationship with the agency was rocky. I know that Ravel had done enough to make them angry. She was moonlighting, she owed them money, and she basically pissed them off. And you learn pretty quickly, don't do that. Select Companions was owned by husband and wife team Zoran and Jane Stanojevic. Jane told police that Ravel owed them about $400 and she'd promised to pay it back on the night she went missing. They had two more bookings for her after the same job. Ravel was booked for the Gavin Samer job from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. She rang select companions from Gavin Samer's house at 5.50 p.m. She told them she was wrapping up the booking and not to pick her up. Samer claims Ravel had agreed to stay on an extra hour for cash undeclared to the agency. Ravel then failed to show for her second booking for select companions later that night. I've seen conflicting statements about where they were when Ravel disappeared, which were huge red flags that I don't think the police addressed at the time. That should have been looked at more closely. Four years later, the New South Wales coroner called an inquest into Ravel's case. Jane and Zoran Stanojevic from Select Companions were questioned on their movements on the day she went missing. On the day they went to pick up a television from Harvey Norman and they bought that, then they went for a pizza in Darlinghurst. They had conflicting stories of what happened after. Zoran said that he uh, went and installed the television at the agency and then went home. His wife said that he went into work and worked that night, which we know he did. He worked from 7 p.m., I think, all the way through. We make no allegations against the Stanojeviks. Jane told us she did everything she could to assist the police. Next. 
Key suspects are called to the inquest. On legal advice, he declined to answer any questions. I honestly believe someone went too far. On the day before her disappearance, Ravel Balmain told a close friend her short career as a sex worker was over, and November 5th would be her last day of bookings. She'd managed to keep her other life a secret from her family and her boyfriend. Police told him a few days after she vanished. Just a pretty horrible moment. Because of his delivery and his attitude, and he just said, I just, just want to let you know. And Ravel's been working as a, as a prostitute. She's, she's no longer a missing person. She's a missing prostitute. Exactly. Just a whole shift of attitude. If Ravel wasn't coming back, police needed to eliminate all possible suspects, including her boyfriend. How much did Piers Fisher Pollard know of Ravel's sex work? Could his movements that night have overlapped with Ravel's? Police always look to eliminate partners in cases like this. You always look at the boyfriend. Always. On that day, he had a headache. He went away. We don't know what he was doing. Did he know Ravel was working? You know, did he discover that day Ravel was working? In these cases, police look to those closest to the victim. Piers was, of course, a suspect. Do you think he's been eliminated? Certainly. I, I'd be 100% sure he's been eliminated. I mean, he had no knowledge of where she was that night. No knowledge whatsoever. And he was one of the few people, apart from her own family and a couple of girls and a flatmate, who pushed the police to investigate, to take this case seriously that she hadn't just gone walk about as they initially suspected. Kim Hollingsworth claims that some of Ravel's co-workers were never questioned by police. She also had these very strange girls around her that were very sexually forceful. I remember one of them in a job, and it was one of Ravel's friends, and and she, pu she pushed my head down like a man into her crotch. And I just remember, wow, that was really violent. And these were from Ravel's circle of friends. Surprising new evidence today at the inquest into missing Sydney model Ravel Balmain, police naming the man they believe responsible for her disappearance. Deputy New South Wales Coroner John Abernathy held an inquest into the disappearance of Ravel Balmain in 1998. What was the inquest like? I thought there were a lot of red herrings that were brought up of people, you know, could have murdered her, rumours said about who took her, and I think even a Saudi prince was supposed to have taken her. You know, there was a lot of mudding in the waters. For the first time, police named Gavin Samer as their prime suspect, laying out all the evidence against him, including the fingernail-like scratches on his neck and chest, and the possible bite mark on his finger. Ravel's last known client was 29-year-old Kingsford man, Gavin Samer. Called as a witness today, on legal advice, he declined to answer any questions. So what was the coroner's finding in the end? Open finding of homicide by a person or persons unknown. Very unsatisfying. Particularly for the family. It's all falling down around our ears now. The thing that kept us going was the fact that something will be done. Justice will be served. But justice hasn't been served today. 
Coroner John Abernethy said while he had some real suspicions about Samer, in the end, there simply wasn't enough evidence to charge him. The deputy coroner went on to say this. Whilst Mr. Samer certainly had the opportunity to kill Ms. Balmain, and rightly in my view is the main person of interest to police, there is no plausible motive. However, he was suspicious about Samer's story of how he paid for his time with Ravel. Gavin Samer says he paid Ravel 400 in cash, which he got from selling his girlfriend's clarinet and winnings from the card machines at the Red Tomato Inn. Neither one of these things could be verified. And then there's the missing $100 check. The police asked him where was the checkbook, and he said the checkbook is missing. And there's something else I want to talk to Kim Hollingsworth about, because she has personal experience of the dangers in the sex industry. Is there a common thread when things go wrong, an atmosphere that is supercharged, that can result in something that's completely unintended actually happening in that situation? I think alcohol's the big one. Above drugs, above anything, alcohol. Particularly when you've got that mix of hormones and, and they're tense and, and they want relief and then they top it off with alcohol. If you were bringing alcohol to a job, yes. as Ravel did mm. that night, yes. you'd have to be pretty sure of who you were drinking with. Yes, you would. So when Ravel was given a bottle of champagne to go to this job, you don't know what state the client's in already. If he's asking for alcohol, he could already be intoxicated and you don't know what's going to happen. It's just going to make him worse. Because alcohol is a factor in so many tragic outcomes in that industry. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's horrific. Ravel had taken champagne to the booking at Samer's request. He later confirmed to police that he'd been drinking throughout the day. How inebriated was he that afternoon? Well, he'd had five twist tops, two bottles of um, Strongbow cider, and at least half a bottle of champagne, if not more. He's a big drinker and he was a strong man. Did Samer have any history of violence at all? There was one interview with a previous girlfriend to the one he had then, who claimed that whenever he got drunk, he got a bit violent and he'd punched her in the face, given her a few black eyes. She says that in the statement. Next. He did not look like a well man. After 15 years off the grid, Gavin Samer gives an exclusive interview. Well, I asked him if he'd killed Ravel Balmain. When the New South Wales coroner returned an open finding into the Ravel Balmain case, Gavin Samer left the state for Tasmania, where he worked as a chef in a small town south of Hobart. John Dale was writing a book about Ravel and wanted Gavin Samer's side of the story. What did you learn in Tasmania? I interviewed his employer. She had a lot of little stories about him. She said he was a huge drinker. Always took his alcohol home, didn't mix with the locals, and that he always called his knife his stabber. She said he'd say, where's my stabber? She said he was always sharpening knives. All chefs would have a knife. But calling it my stabber was an unusual What inferences did you draw from those conversations? He was a loner who drank a lot, who didn't mix with the locals, who kept to himself. He had a girlfriend, just stayed with her. So when he wasn't working in the pub, he'd buy his alcohol and take it home. She said he was a really big drinker. 
Dale only spoke to Seymour once, and that was when he was working in Tasmania at an oyster farm. He wasn't forthcoming. What did he say? He said, piss off, basically, but a bit more aggressively than that. Seymour may have thought that apart from a curious author, everyone had forgotten about him. He was wrong. In 2008, detectives from the Unsolved Homicide Squad finally sent a forensic team into the Kingsford house where Seymour used to live. They were looking for anything to link the house to her murder. And it was reported at the time they had found new evidence. New forensics like DNA sampling and laser lights may also prove critical in cases like Ravel Balmain. Her shoes and other items found scattered around the Sydney suburb of Kingsford just days after her disappearance are now being re-examined for DNA that simply wasn't traceable even five years ago. And then detectives, five of them, flew down to Tasmania to interview Kevin Seymour and he refused to give a DNA test. They didn't come up with anything. Apart from putting additional pressure on Seymour, no charges were laid and he melted back into the scenery. Ten years later, an eagle-eyed journalist saw his name on a Sydney court list. My name is Stephen Gibbs. I've been covering crime for about 30 years. In 2018, I saw Gavin Owen Seymour appear on a court list. I immediately recognised that name from Ravel's disappearance and from the coronial inquest. I attended court on the off chance that he would speak to me. Were there any other journalists there? No, there was no one else there. Seymour was facing Sydney's Waverley Court on theft charges. Gavin Seymour hadn't been seen for 20 years. As far as I know, no one had seen him or spoken to him since the coronial inquest. You'd seen photographs of him from earlier times. How did those tally with the man you saw in court? Gavin Seymour had changed remarkably in the 20 years since the coronial inquest. Clearly looked unwell, lost a lot of condition. He did not look like a well man. So here's your moment. Describe the circumstances of, of getting out there and, and collaring him. Mr Seymour started walking down the street. I approached him and introduced myself. I said that I wanted to talk to him about the disappearance of Ravel Balmain in 1994. And his first response was, oh, is it that long ago? I said, yes, it is, Gavin. Would you like to talk about it? We sat in a bus shelter opposite the court for the next half an hour. He recounted what he'd been doing for the previous 20 years and spoke to me about the disappearance of Ravel Balmain. And so what questions did you put to him? Well, I asked him if he'd killed Ravel Balmain, and he said he had not. He repeatedly said that he had nothing to do with her disappearance. His most telling line for me was probably, he said, I've done nothing wrong. I hired a hooker. That's all I ever did. Big deal. I found that cold, some would say callous, but he seemed to have far more interest in how this whole case had affected him than it had affected Ravel Balmain's family. He complained that occasional publicity about Ravel's disappearance and the continued police interest in him had cost him jobs. He generally felt persecuted and said he was unfortunate to be in that position. So there must have been a reason to speak to you. What do you think that was? I don't know why Mr Seymour 
chose to speak to me, but he addressed every question I asked him. He was aware that he was the main suspect in Ravel Balmain's disappearance. Said numerous times, I know that the police think that I am guilty, but I am not. Gibbs never expected to hear from Samer again. But a year later, he got a late night phone call. It was 10.30 at night, I was settling into bed and phone rang and he said, hello Stephen, it's Gavin Samer. Have you heard the latest? I said, no Gavin, what's the latest? He said, I've been charged with rape. In 2019, Gavin Samer rang journalist Stephen Gibbs to say that he'd been charged with raping his flatmate, Rosa Rosenberg, at the apartment they shared in Sydney's Bondi. In fact, Samer wasn't charged with rape, but indecent assault, and assault occasioning actual bodily harm and stalking. Rosa Rosenberg had a fairly troubled life. She had physical and mental impairments. There was a history of substance abuse. And a court later heard that she had a complicated relationship with Gavin Samer. Rosenberg had employed Samer as her live-in carer. She relayed her version of the alleged assault to John Dale, and he took notes. She said she came home at 11 a.m. He was drunk and abusive. He started abusing me, calling me crazy stupid. He broke my office chair. He burnt my candle. I said, leave my flat and give me back my key. He stood up and he slapped me very hard. I said, you slapped me and you broke my earring. I start to be very scared of him. He found a bottle of wine and threatened to hit me. I asked for my key and he wouldn't give it back. He took my epilepsy tablets from the table. He pulled the knife from the kitchen and put it to my throat and said, I will fucking cut your throat and watch every last drop come out. Gavin Samer was convicted of assault, occasioning actual bodily harm and stalking or intimidating Rosa Rosenberg in September 2019. But four months later, and still facing the indecent assault charges, there was a shocking development. In January 2020, there was an explosion and fire in Rosa Rosenberg's unit. She suffered terrible burns, was taken to hospital and died. Was that fire suspicious? Emergency services seem to believe that that fire may have been lit by Rosa Rosenberg, but that will be a matter for the coroner. The coroner hasn't ruled yet on, on, on what happened there, but here's a person with whom he was associated who's now dead. It was described in court as unfortunate that Gavin Samer had these associations with two women who met bad ends. For the Rosenberg case, Samer's assault conviction was overturned on the basis of insufficient evidence that he'd physically harmed Rosa, and the indecent assault charges were dropped. Samer moved to the Gold Coast and tried to keep a low profile, but a current affair tracked him down. Can you tell me what you know about the disappearance of Ravel Balmain? See, I've got no thoughts, I've got no interest, just piss off. Excuse me, officer. Officer, I'm being stalked by and grew here. Can you tell him to piss off? Gavin, if you want to talk to these police, would you be willing to speak to New South Wales police? 
What would be the options that, that are before him at the moment to meet this investigation head on and prove his innocence? Well, Gavin Samer obviously does not have to prove his innocence. Police have to make any case. But he could probably assist himself by giving one consistent version of what happened on the last day and night that Ravel Balmain was alive. And some DNA as well. He could also provide DNA. Do you think he's likely to do that, given what you know of him? I don't think there's any chance of Gavin Samer voluntarily providing DNA. While we were investigating Ravel Balmain's case, Detective Chief Inspector Stuart Bell invited us for a meeting at police headquarters. He said he was re-examining the case and there would soon be a major announcement. It's one of Sydney's most intriguing murder mysteries. Ravel Balmain hasn't been seen in almost 30 years. Police are now offering $1 million to anyone who can help catch her killer. There's been a lot of advances in uh, DNA technology and we are re-examining all available evidence at the time. She has a living sister, which we went and saw last week. We just want to see that this reward will bring them some satisfaction and that someone will be charged with the crime. What would you say to anybody who is watching this tonight, having any kind of information about what happened to Ravel, your sister? It's important. Um, I've, I've always believed in an eye for an eye. And I think, you know, to have to find her, to find what's left of her um, and to have someone charged, that's the most important thing to me. It must have taken a terrific toll on your family. It did. Ivor and Mum both passed without ever knowing anything. When the coronial inquest happened, Mum was sitting next to her and her hand started to shake. And I believe that was the start of her Parkinson's. That's how upsetting that was for her. I mean, I couldn't talk to her for the past couple of years because it just was too upsetting. Ivor, he wasn't very vocal, I suppose, but I could see the pain that was inside of him. It was destroying. Ravel Balmain's parents sat in the front row of that coroner's court every day, hearing evidence that I'm sure they did not want to hear or expect to hear. Things that no parent should ever have to hear. They carried themselves with absolute dignity throughout the proceedings. And I think the coroner, John Abernethy, wanted to acknowledge that. And he did so in a very classy way. After the coroner had handed down his findings, I'd stayed back in court, just taking some notes. Eventually, the coroner walked down from the bench and approached Ravel Balmain's parents and hugged each of them individually. Something I've never seen before, and I've never seen since. There is still work going on in this case. So what would be your call now? There's certainly still more that can be done. Anyone who saw anything on that night, however seemingly insignificant at the time, should be coming forward now. Someone must have seen something. <laughs>